it's Ming Canada here. You are listening to the Trips and Global on Wheels Podcast Hour, the place to be to learn about the latest and greatest life stories from people who are doing incredible disability advocacy work. Jill Moore, welcome to the Trips and Global on Wheels Podcast Hour. Thanks. So Joe Moore works with the landscape structure team to aid in product development and promote the importance of inclusive play. During her college career at the University of Illinois, Joe competed on two occasions representing the United States on the world stage in track and field doing wheelchair racing. Through an active life, Joe constantly strives to not only employ a lifetime of experience, but to promote the importance of play as it truly shapes us all and allows us to overcome some truly incredible things. As you reminded me a couple days ago, Jill, we actually met through a wheelchair competition in Eugene, Oregon, correct? Mm -hmm. We did. Do you remember the event? Uh, It was an exhibition leading up to the, I believe it was part of the 2012 uh, Olympic Games. It was part of the trials. Yeah, I I remember that summer actually because I was a volunteer um, through our school and it was was amazing. I really enjoyed it. I know that um, you race the short, shorter distances, right? 100 meter, 200 meter, 400 meter, whereas I did the 3,000 and 1,500 meter. Um, so what do you like about the shorter distances? Because for me, at least, I always felt like, um, I, for especially the 100 meter, um, I just gained momentum and just got warmed up. And then it's yeah. over. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's what I liked about it, that it was over really fast. During my time at Illinois, actually, I mean, none of us could escape the marathon. Uh, As soon as you showed up for your freshman year, I I remember coach looking at you saying, all right, you're signed up for the Chicago Marathon, regardless of if you were a sprinter or not, because it was always a a good tool to have in your hat to be able to race those endurance races. So um, even though on the USA stage I competed sprinting, uh, I did 12 marathons over the course of my racing career. Um, I mean, I know the distance racers do a whole lot more, but 12 felt like a lot. That's awesome. So I know you have spina bifida and uh, you uh, described it this way in one of your blog posts, I believe. You said, essentially, this means I was born with a hole in my st- spine, which caused the lower half of my body to develop differently than my peers. At age seven, I popped a squat into a manual wheelchair and I stuck with it from then on. So do you mind sharing with us just how spinal bifida, I'm sure people have heard of it, um, how that has uh, impacted your life and shaped your life? Yeah, so uh, it's a birth defect essentially where my spinal column didn't close all the way. And so that meant as my body was developing, um, my legs weren't necessarily getting with the program. Uh, A lot of the nerves to my lower extremities were damaged. So um, my legs weren't forming typically, uh, my lower intestinal tract, things like that, uh, parts of my body, um, nerves weren't connecting all the way, essentially. And so growing up, it it made it very challenging because I moved very differently as a child. Um, And so I hadn't been exposed to adaptive sport, adaptive play until age nine. And so there was this kind of weird portion in my life where I spent a very long time trying to figure out how to fit in and what my new normal would be, what that really looked like. And so um, I I finally got involved in adaptive athletics at age nine and that, that brought a whole new world of positivity, independence, confidence my way. Uh, But I think the big part of it, and I really, I love sharing this aspect, is that giving me my first wheelchair was the greatest thing anybody could have ever done. And I think there's this stigma that uh, a wheelchair is bad or that giving up walking is bad. But I mean, for me, this was freedom. I mean, when somebody said, here, have this wheelchair, suddenly I wasn't the slowest one pushing to lunch with my classmates or it wasn't wait for Jill. It was suddenly I was given mobility. And so I I think uh, receiving that first wheelchair was the first time I started to really celebrate my disability because it was the first time I kind of recognized that there is freedom in spina bifida, that I can move around, that this is possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Very well said. So how did you move around prior to age seven then? Because you didn't use a wheelchair. Yeah, so um, good question. I should have pointed that out. Uh, it was a lot of crawling. It was a lot of just making do with what I could. Uh, I had little pink crutches that I would use. And um, the worst thing in the world, which I hated and everybody knew it, was my walker. And uh, these were a lot of things. These were a lot of things given to me by therapists, by family that we all advocated for that were going to make my little legs stronger, um, but inevitably made it a lot more challenging to get around. And so, yeah, a lot of different mobility aids, but it all was centered around walking. Mm -hmm. Did your parents not know about wheelchairs prior to that? Or is that, how, how did you not get exposed to a wheelchair until age seven? We all knew about it. Um, but I think even myself, I mean, my parents, they're probably going to watch this. So I have to say nice things about them. But um, no, I mean, they've always been in my corner. They've been some of my biggest advocates. And we all knew about wheelchairs. But I think uh, in my mind, too, as a child, it, it wasn't this idea of positivity. I, I don't think any of us saw as this thing that we wanted to move me to full time. I think we saw a lot of potential because I do have a little bit of leg motion. And so we saw a lot of potential in capitalizing on that, really making it work and just fighting uh, for normalcy. I mean, maybe we thought I was going to Forrest Gump out of my crutches and run away one day. But I, I, I think as a whole, all of us were really working hard to strengthen my legs and get me back walking and make that easier when none of us really realized that a wheelchair is freedom. I mean, I, I just think we didn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, you're right, you're touching on like the perception of a wheelchair and how and the negative messages that surrounds that in the mainstream. Um, and I think you're right, a lot of tools, like a wheelchair, which is a tool, um, get marketed in such a negative way that people just want to disassociate themselves from it, even though it may be really beneficial, like you experienced with a wheelchair. It made you a lot faster, able to not only keep up, but go even faster than, than your peers doing right. the different activities. And so I think, I think um, wheelchairs, canes, other kinds of tools also have these negative um, uh, messages, associations um, that are, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, correlating to them. And so, yeah, that's a very important message to share of how you see it as something that gave you mobility or for increased sure. I mean, your mobility. I think it's important that everybody remembers that wheelchairs, canes, crutches, they're mobility aids. It's the exact same thing as wearing glasses. It's, it's improving your quality of life through the assistive device. And so, I mean, it's, it's closer to a pair of glasses in my book, which are considered a fashion statement. I mean, people wear glasses and pick them out to look cool. And that's more or less what we're doing with wheelchairs. We pick out this thing that helps us maneuver and get around better. Mm -hmm, exactly. So that actually segues really well onto my next question for you, which is how would you change about how your parents, your family members, or siblings, if you have any friends, um, advocated for you while, when you were growing up? Um, and if there's nothing that you would change, what did they do right that other families uh, and people out there should uh, emulate? I think the most critical thing my parents ever taught me, um, they did a really incredible job at teaching me that I'm never an object to be pitied. And I mean, sure, I'm sometimes they probably didn't look like the nicest people for it, but they treated me like a regular kid. I mean, if there was a challenge, they, they worked alongside me to overcome it. They didn't just do it for me. And so I think they were really always in my corner making sure that I never believed that I was as different as I looked. And then, I mean, them alongside of my friends, I had a lot of people who did things right. The only thing I wish we would have changed is I wish we knew about it sooner. Uh, I wish we knew about adaptive play sooner. I wish we knew about this world of adaptive sports sooner. Because uh, it took a while. It took a really long learning curve of trying to figure things out, trying to find my place in the world, what I really wanted to do. And so because of that, um, I, it was never anything on my friends, my family, or things like that. But it was kind of 
the world around me hadn't quite caught up. I think inclusion and what we can do for that and adaptive activity is becoming more of a prevalent conversation that a lot of people are really having. Uh, and so I think the world is changing in a really positive way. I remember the first time uh, I was hanging out with my, he was six at the time, six year old nephew, and he had just watched me compete at the Paralympic trials. And a little girl said, well, it didn't count that you're at the Paralympic trials. That's not the real Olympics. And at six years old, he looked at her and said, well, it's more than you've ever done. And so you're kind of sitting there going like, oh, dang, but you realize, I mean, the people around you really are celebrating what you can do and they really are advocating for you. And they're, you know, much more ambitious, aiming for the stars, right? Higher than the stars, inclusive place. Um, how did you come up with the idea to go into that field in the first place? Because as you know, that's quite unusual and, you know, a particular type of feel. Right. I did not. Um, I had actually gone to school to study design and I was full speed ahead to study medical design. I thought that was kind of my, my ticket to paradise there. Um, but I had just competed in the 2016 Paralympic trials and uh, they were hosted in my hometown of Charlotte, North Carolina. And so the, the city was speaking at the U.S. Play Coalition. It's a conference in Clemson every year. Uh, and the town was just talking about how they did it and kind of their journey of hosting the Paralympic Games. And they invited me to speak with them being a hometown athlete. And I got to talk about just how play was so critical and shaping all of the opportunity I've ever really had. And my current employer happened to be sitting in on that session. And they invited me up for a plant tour to see how playgrounds are made and uh, suddenly that turned into a job interview and then suddenly I kind of fell into this world of inclusive play, which was a conversation I wasn't even really aware was happening. And so there was a, a huge learning curve and figuring out how much the conversation has changed, but playgrounds had never been on my radar. So it was really dumb luck. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, that's a great coincidence there. So growing up, describe what recess was like for you. What was playtime with your peers like for you? And how has that informed your work today with inclusive play? And why is inclusive play so important? So it's a two-pronged question there. Yeah. Almost three-pronged. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, growing up, recess sucked. I mean, we can just throw that one out there. I mean, it was like winning the lottery if my teacher told me I could stay inside the math classroom that day, which is so lame. But at the time, I never knew what I was missing. I mean, I never knew what a positive experience play and recess really was, that these kids were making so many connections, that they were learning these social skills, these cognitive skills, the physical benefits. They were getting so much from play. Um, and more often than not, I would prefer to stay up by the building and build houses in the bushes for resident bugs and like that that was my day that was what I looked forward to doing was playing in the bushes pretty much but um, on days where I did try to go to recess the playground was really never designed to support someone like me I mean it was covered in wood chips it was a whole lot of climbers um, back at the time playgrounds were very ADA count focused um, the Americans with Disability Act it came around in the 1990s. In 2000, we created guidelines for the children's play space. In 2010, those guidelines became law. So it wasn't even a law that the playground had to be compliant at the time. And so if people really were hitting this ADA count, it's kind of lame. It was uh, a steering wheel and a post. It was wood chips all over the playground. They were considered accessible surfacing. So it was an environment that, um, I mean, more often than not, there was really nothing for me. And so if I did try to keep up, it was a whole lot of crawling, a whole lot of getting stepped on, moving a lot slower, waiting in line for one component that I could do, and that'd be the swings. So it really, it was never a, a rich experience for me. And kids never do these things out of malice. They, they never mean to leave you behind, but they're, they're playing. They're in their world. Uh, and so getting the job that I have now, uh, that's what I remembered playgrounds being. And so it was, it was really hard to add to the conversation for a while because I only remembered where it was at. And so the first time I got to go to an inclusive playground, it 
kind of rocked my world for the smallest reasons. It was that I was having a conversation with a coworker and we were pushing across the playground and it occurred to me that like, wow, I'm keeping up with you. I'm not going through the wood chips right now. I mean, there's things that are on this play space specifically for me to do. And so it was kind of cool to see truly how much this conversation has shifted and how much further than just ADA compliance, we're starting to push these boundaries. Yeah, I think a lot, of, a lot of us people with especially physical disabilities have stories of um, negative, if not traumatizing, you know, experiences of keeping up with your peers during recess, playtime, um, or any such similar experiences. I know I certainly do being a manual wheelchair user myself and uh, and also like you not using a wheelchair until later on in life despite needing one. So um, what incredible things can we overcome with inclusive play? Yeah, I mean, I think the coolest part about play is that it becomes a universal language. I mean, it's this chance where I mean, I, I know growing up and maybe you have a similar experience, but if you go to a sleepover or something like that, suddenly your disability was on the back burner once you got engaged in play. And so it was something that, uh, it was those incredible moments where I got to forget about all of those things that made me different as a kid that you're still developing, that you're still processing and trying to figure out what exactly that means. And so I think play, uh, it's critical because it is this, great common denominator and you can truly get past all of those physical or cognitive differences that separate us and just engage and and be a person and be seen for that person who you are and what you have to bring to the table and I think uh, one of the coolest part about inclusive play is it's starting to look beyond just the wheelchair user I mean this is looking at uh, children with autism or sensory processing disorder I mean some of the stats we have on that is one in 59 children are diagnosed with autism. And so this is a group of kids who, if we're really relying on the ADA, they haven't necessarily been supported on the play space. And so we're learning about sensory play, about things that uh, can really support the specific user and let them kind of get that engagement and those benefits of play, uh, but also normalize it for other kids. I mean, I remember we were at a playground in Tennessee and there was a big spinner and all these kids are sitting on this big group spinner. So I get out of my chair. We're all spinning together. I lose a shoe in the process. It's a wild time. Uh, and then they all help me get out of my chair. They're asking what I needed. Um, nobody asked me what was wrong with me. Uh, and this little girl looks at me at the end and said, man, I wish I was in a wheelchair. And so it was, it was kind of funny to me just to see that this interaction, this moment of play, this quick second in time, it's changing how they perceive disability. And so it's kind of play is our chance to really rewrite social stigma, rewrite social norm. Mm -hmm. I was really happy to see that you do this kind of work because I think, you know, entertainment, sports, play uh, is neutral grounds where people really put their partisanship and their uh, differences people's differences where where people are more easily able to let their guard down and that's why yes. they're able to bond in sports arenas in you know uh comedy centers when jokes are being told or when they're playing and doing different kinds of fun activities it's not polarized you know yeah and so you're the first person i've met doing inclusive play um uh, work. So I think that's so incredibly important because it creates this neutral ground where people understand each other as individuals instead of right. as these um, exterior shells with all these superficial differences. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it, it's incredible to watch that happen, to watch that play out. Um, we had been at an inclusive playground uh, where a little girl approached and she was using a walker and she had been super quiet. I mean, she really was not going out of her way to interact with a lot of these kids. It was kind of like, oh, you're sitting there kind of wondering like, is inclusive play working? Is it a thing that actually happens? But um, 
we have a, a merry-go-round in our collection. It's called the We Go Round, and it's accessible. And so suddenly she gets on this We Go Round, and the first thing I heard her say was, "Last one off loses." And all of a sudden, every other kid in this We Go Round are turning to her for what are the rules? What can I do? What can I get away with? And she's becoming this little We Go Round dictator. Uh, but it was so cool to just watch this this social traction pick up and to start to see her as a playmate, um, not just the girl in the walker who's using this special equipment, but she holds value. Her presence here is something that we're going to look towards, we're going to ask, we're going to have fun with. So That's really awesome. Do you have a memory of a specific time for yourself where you were playing and you just felt you belonged and add, added value and was just just much a part of that group as as your friends? That question specifically, it kind of struck me because when I started to work with landscape structures and in the world of playgrounds, um, you started to hear the word inclusion, inclusive, and social equity everywhere. I mean, there was these buzzwords. And so I started to think, well, what did that mean to me? Why, why is this relevant? When did I first get that? And so uh, it was never on a playground, not for a very long time. But when I did start wheelchair sports, when I was nine years old, uh, I was invited to my very first wheelchair basketball tournament. And we played one game. We were in Maryland. And then Maryland got three feet of snow. And so we were all snowed in. Uh, we were staying. It was a red roof in that I distinctly remember being so off-brand that it had a blue roof. And um, we were, had nothing but our sports chairs and a conference room. And so we invented a game. It was called Ramarama. And Ramarama was very simple. One kid started here, one kid started here, and you push full speed until you crashed into each other in the middle and you just really hope they fell out of their chairs. It was ridiculous. Um, but we played this all week. We were snowed in, we were stuck, and the parents were not loving Ramarama. They came to our coach and they said, Coach, we just got all these brand new sports chairs, all this new equipment. Uh, you got to tell them to stop. And uh, Dave Kiley, he's a just phenomenal name in wheelchair basketball, but he looked back at them and he said, I don't want to see a speck of paint left on those wheelchairs. And that was kind of the coolest thing I had ever heard at the time, because that was the first, th first time someone said, go be a kid. You're strong, you're durable, you can have this risky play and you're going to endure it. You're going to bounce back. You're, you're more than just, like you said, this brittle shell of a human. And uh, it was kind of cool because suddenly we were the hot button topic. We were the one, we were the thing everybody wanted to come join in on. They wanted to come play with us. And so uh, we were in our chairs, we were out of our chairs. It didn't matter who had what ability. It was just all that we were relevant. We all belonged there. We needed every single one of us to play, to be a part of this game. And I don't know, that was, I guess, the first time where I realized like, oh, I, my personality, myself, my being belongs here. And I've, I've got this equal space to really flourish and do so. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful story. Um, so in your ideal utopic world, what would you like to see inclusive play develop into in the future? It's going to sound ridiculous, but I want it to, I want the term to disappear. Um, I, I think if we're doing our jobs right, if we're creating these inclusive playgrounds, uh, the word inclusive is going to go away because we're going to look at it. It's going to be such a usable space to all that it's just going to be called a damn cool playground. Um, and I, I think that's kind of sounds so counterintuitive to what we all work for. But if we're getting inclusive play right, uh, it's not obvious it's we don't look at this play space and we don't say well this is a space for special needs kids or a space for kids who are different we just say this is something and somewhere that is usable by all it's accessible to all there's something truly for everyone we're not separating the the disabled versus the normal we're just playing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's great moving on to dating oh boy. how <laughs> How was dating from the vantage point of, of sitting in a wheelchair? Weird. Um, I know growing up in like middle school and high school, uh, that's when 
I was still really struggling to develop a lot of these social skills. Um, I was still feeling as different as I looked. And so I always thought I was something no one, no able-bodied boy would want to date in high school because I was in a wheelchair. And so um, because of that, I think it became kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I, I didn't have these social skills to, to interact with people normally. I was always trying really hard. I was trying to prove some, to be something I wasn't. I was, um, I wasn't being my authentic self, which I think is a huge part of, of dating. People see you and who you are and they want to get to know that person. But I was being, I was all over the place. Uh, and so it got a little bit better when I got to college and started to find out um, passions, what I wanted to pursue when my major, I started to get really heavily into Team USA Racing and I started to place more value on what I was and who who I was and what I was doing in life than, uh, oh crap, I've got to compensate for being this disabled person. And so, I mean, it, it was weird for a while. You would get on Tinder, you would be pushing down the street, you'd be at the bar and you would get ridiculously offensive questions. Um, I was pushing down the street with a friend of mine once and somebody stopped us and said, what class are you two in? And they said, what? And he said, what project are you doing? Why are you using a wheelchair right now? Uh, we, we were thunderstruck. We didn't know how to answer that. And he goes, yeah, because you're both too hot to actually be in a wheelchair. And it was kind of just this moment of like, oh God, there is this weird expectation that you can't be feminine, you can't be beautiful, you can't feel confident and be disabled at the same time. And so it was definitely a learning experience and separating the, the men from the boys, I guess. And um, kind of figuring out how to build this self-worth, this confidence, this, if you don't like me for my disability, then you are not worth a cent of my time. Like, um, and learning how to really, really separate that and put that distinction in. And so there were a lot of weird parts and there's a lot of weird parts in just uh, dating an able body who might not have that experience with disability. Um, I eventually, I mean, catheters, I think they're a weird part of disability that nobody ever wants to talk about, but having to cath is the reality of going to the bathroom. And so uh, you could always kind of gauge a man's willingness by how he handled it when he learned you cathed. Um, and so I had one guy who I dated who carried around spare catheters for me in his backpack. And so some people who are just really kind hearted and uh, have that capacity, they're, they're beyond willing to learn about disability and to celebrate it and be there with you for it. And some people think it's really weird. And so there were a lot of weird moments kind of navigating that and figuring it out. Yeah, it is definitely a process. I think uh, we all have, you know, us individuals with disabilities, it's awkward in the beginning and then we, you know, learn. For some of us, it's a longer process and for others of us, it's a shorter process. And so I think to be able to hear um, honestly and candidly about these experiences is so important. So for your relationship, your partnership, um, I know you're engaged, congrats, Thanks. very <laughs> delayed, um, but do you see that the, you know, your fiancés, or are you guys married now? Uh, still just engaged. Okay. October. i got to like plan a whole wedding, but that's a different story. Oh, okay. Um, is your your fiance's experience of being in a wheelchair with a physical disability as well um is that more of a opportunity for further bonding and understanding yeah or, and yeah uh and maybe things cut out but i i can't really reiterate it enough but um our our disability it's common ground but it was never the defining factor it was never uh, I'm with you because you're an able body or because you have a disability. It's we like the same shows, movies, music. It, it, it again is just a lot of strength of having common ground. It's a lot of strength of uh, if I have a ridiculous, I mean, disability, it comes with ridiculous experiences. It comes with the good, the bad, the ugly, bad travel stories, different stigmas, different people approaching you in different ways. Uh, and it's kind of cool to have that person on your team that is always there and is always going to understand it and has been through it. Um, 
he got his disability uh, at a different age. So I was born with mine and he had a ac car accident when he was 12. And so our experience with disability is not always necessarily the same. And so um, I think that different perspective, actually, it's something in our corner. It's something we're able to talk about, about the changes, about growing up, about uh, where we each did hit our social roadblocks. And um, it's a cool learning experience all the time. Yeah, that's awesome. I think people with uh, physical disabilities don't really get that perspective as much as that they want to of hearing young people like us discuss dating and rather that be dating people who are able-bodied or people who are, have a disability. Um, so next question, um, how, what are the challenges of uh, dating someone who's able-bodied when you're in a wheelchair? Or what are the challenges, compare, compare that to the challenges of dating another person who is also in a wheelchair? Um, yeah. How is that experience? All over the place. I mean, again, some able bodies really get it. Some are there to learn. I mean, I know uh, every single able body guy I've dated, they have come back and told me that they've Googled all the intricacies of spina bifida before we went on our first date. Um, so as soon as they learned I was disabled, what I had, they wanted to know more. And so uh, a lot of people take it upon themselves to get this base level of learning, to get this, okay, I'm gonna kind of figure out what's the groundwork here, or how can maybe I talk to this person, or uh, what questions do I ask without sounding like a total jerk, I guess. And, and, and I really admire those people who do that versus, I mean, I don't know, and maybe you've experienced this too. I know a lot of my female friends in wheelchairs have, but I cannot tell you the amount of times a guy has come up to me in a bar and been like, hey, so can you have sex? And like, that's, that's awful. That's so offensive and gross to hear. Um, and also so freaking personal that people feel entitled to that information. And so uh, I think it's so dependent on the person. Um, I don't think you can say it's always going to be easy to date an able body, but I don't think it's always going to be hard. I think uh, with regular dating, there's a learning curve to absolutely everything to figuring out a person. And so I, I think that's a big part of it is is being with somebody who is willing to learn and that you feel safe to learn with. And what about the challenges of dating another person who has a physical disability? Fitting all the wheelchairs into a car. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, it's hard to answer that, I suppose, because uh, especially... especially in my current situation, uh, being engaged to someone with a disability, I think that's the last thing on our list of things we look at, uh, what are the challenges. I think it, it turns out more logistical things of can we both fit into this elevator and dumb stuff like that. But um, I think also, I guess maybe early on dating and thinking back to that, some of the hard parts of dating within disability is uh, people have different feelings about their disability, different views on it. And I know I was part of that as well, of I might not have been as positive or as uh, confident in my self-worth. And a lot of that had to do with disability. And so I think one of the trickiest parts of dating uh, another disabled person is figuring out how at peace they are with this hand they've been dealt. And I, I think that can lend itself to something really positive if you both do really love and celebrate your abilities, what you can do and who you are, or something absolutely devastating if one of you is still hung up on the fact that you're different. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think you're such a great example of a person who, you know, has a disability and accepts it, embraces it, not only in yourself, but in other people. That's such maturity that you don't see very much even in the disability community and so that's why I wanted to ask that question because I know there are hesitations even from you know people with disabilities dating other people who have who also have disabilities it's very rare to see people with disabilities uh, who not only embrace the and accept their disabilities 
for themselves, which is already a lot, you know, in a mm -hmm. society that has so much negative, uh, that put out so much negativity towards disability and to be able to come to that level of acceptance and then and embracing your identity, that aspect of your identity is already a lot. But for you, you also embrace it for others, in others, you know, in that you have a fiance who also uses a wheelchair and has a physical disability. And I think that's something that we don't see that often, especially at, in the media, in, in mainstream media, but especially. And uh, to, um, yeah. to have such a positive, healthy example and like genuine example of this is, is amazing. Thank you. Um, and I think I, I really appreciate that because it took a while. I mean, that was some of the hardest lessons to really learn in life. Um, and, and I think it, I never woke up one day and said, oh, I'm disabled. I freaking love it. I think it, it took a lot of time. It took a lot of experiences. It took a lot of hard parts. And I think a, a big part of my journey with disability was moving on from college and finding a lot of identity outside of being an athlete. And so I think the playground journey, um, it was hard. It was really, really hard to start to add to this conversation of something I had never been a part of before. But I think that was a really big part of this discovery and learning that um, the way we live, the way we act, the way we perceive ourselves, it helps change that conversation. It really does. It helps people perceive us differently and helps them join our team in a way. And so I think uh, a big part of this, this healing and this discovery and the confidence that came with it was jumping into a world that had never been built for me and to see that people around me are changing it. And so having to, to find that voice in the mix of one of the hardest conversations that I've been a part of, uh, it helped me go from Jill, the disabled athlete, to just Jill. And I, I think that was a really big part of my transition there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think even people with disabilities, right? Um, and perhaps I'll get in trouble for saying this, uh, generalizing here, is even people with disabilities, they lean towards dating someone who's able-bodied rather than somebody with a disability. And, and I think that has a lot to do with the immensely negative messages that are sent out in the mainstream media that is portrayed in movies and ads and you know, TV shows. And uh, going back to the beginning of this interview, you were saying, you know, your parents and you were uh, leaning away from using a wheelchair because of the perception of it. And so it's the same thing here. So moving to the flip side now, what are the advantages of dating someone in a wheelchair who can share that experience with you and understand where you're coming from? For starters, he knows how to change a tire, which I never bothered to learn. <laughs> I, I travel a lot. I travel all the time for my job, which is pretty neat, but I get a lot of flight attendants who act like I shouldn't be traveling. Uh, the airport staff always seems very surprised that uh, someone in a wheelchair is traveling on their own. And um, I think it's cool that at the end of the day, when I have these ridiculous experiences, I can go back and talk to somebody who's lived it, who's heard it, who knows it, and who can either laugh with me or say, hey, that sucks and we can move on, but we don't have to ruminate on what's unnecessary. We don't have to ignore what was really impactful. We can kind of cipher through it together on what we need to spend our time and energy on versus what's good to let go. And so that's been really, really positive to just have that shared experience and, and someone who really understands every part of disability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. That was our last question. Thank you so much, Jill. You're very candid and very open with your responses. And uh, I think our, our listeners and viewers will be able to learn a lot from you. So thank, thank you for participating. Thank you for inviting me. And hi, mom and dad, because I know you're going to watch this. Did you like this video? If so, share with your friends and be sure to follow us on social media. And if you want even more resources, be sure to sign up for our email updates on our website, traipsingglobal.com. Keep learning new perspectives. 
keep being inclusive because it will make the world a better place for you and for everyone else. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you on another episode of the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour.